want to say thank you for the introduction. Also, thank you for the community for inviting us and having us here. Uh, not only for the uh, fall fair, but also for the conference. Uh, today, I want to talk about uh, a man whose name uh, instills both a sense of esteem and infamy. However, it seems more that people focus, uh, whether in stories, also in historical records, more about his name rather than the man himself. Um, and also his position as a symbol of the brutal nature and environment that surrounded the War of 1812. On the balmy morning of August 15, 1812, the gates of Fort Dearborn opened and a nervous parade of its inhabitants began to evacuate. The evacuation was a direct order handed down to the fort's commander, Nathaniel Held, by U.S. General William Hull, stationed at Detroit. Hull's insistence to hastily evacuate the post came with the defeat of Fort Mackinac. Dearborn's major supply repository. The migrating party, totaling 96, consisted of military regulars, militia, and their families. Escorting the party was a small band of Miami warriors led by William Wells, son-in-law to the prominent Miami headman Little Turtle and commander of Fort Wayne, the immigrating party's destination. As they traveled south along the shore of Lake Michigan, they were unknowingly pursued by a party of a war party of over 500. Kickapoo, Sock, Ho-Chunk, and Potawatomi. For over a mile, the war party led by Suganok, or Blackbird, intently hid behind the sand dunes, peppering the shores of the lake, preparing their weapons for an attack. With the signal given, swarms of native warriors poured over the dunes, cutting the parade in half with gunfire. In an attempt to counter, Held ordered his troops to attack the center of the native warriors, hoping to repel them back over the dunes. However, the number of Indian attackers was just far too great. As more and more flooded from the sand, American flanks fell and the rear column was taken. With main force of American troops defeated, the attackers moved towards the wagons of civilians, protected only by a handful of militia. In a fierce bout of hand-to-hand -hand combat, the remaining defenders fell, leaving the wagons of women and children free to the attackers, who did not hesitate to quiet their screams. With his victory secured, Siganok meets with Held to arrange a truce to negotiate prisoner exchange, each survivor carrying a ransom of $100 apiece. When the negotiations ended, Blackbird and his warriors returned to the battlefield to perform a ceremony to warriors of the Northwest. Respected for his military prowess, the dead Captain Wells, his heart is cut out and distributed amongst Blackbird's party. It is thought that by consuming one's enemy, their power could be obtained. Rounding up their valuable captives, Siganok and troops marched back to Fort Dearborn amongst the sea of decapitated heads and dismembered body parts to collect more retribution. Despite agreeing to Held's terms of prisoner release, the intertribal war party continued to kill their captives, motivating local neutral Potawatomi to come to their aid. With the sun setting, the decisive native victory, a battle won in less than half an hour, culminated in the sack and burning of the abandoned fort. With the flames to their back, Saganok and a platoon of warriors departed south to align with Potawatomi from the St. Joseph region to plan their next, next attack, the siege of Fort Wayne. Descending from leadership, where Blackbird excelled on the battlefield, his father's prowess was oration and diplomacy. Saganok the Elder, a headman from Milwaukee, dominated councils among the powerful Meshkodan band of the western sides of Lake Michigan. Given his position as an opportune conduit to northern Anishinaabe Confederates, he was continually courted by both British and American delegates during the Revolutionary War in hopes of rallying forces to a cohesive cause. Despite regularly receiving lavish gifts, he adamantly stayed neutral. His firm stands for keeping peace, one that alienated him from more militant Potawatomi bands, was never misconstrued as weakness. His seemingly impermeable convictions were a sign of his steadfast indifference to English strong-arm tactics of regularly using Iroquois muscle to force them into an alliance, threats that did prove to be legitimate for the St. Joseph and Detroit Potawatomi. However, with the victorious occupation of Illinois, a display of American power by the hand of Kentuckian George Rogers Clark and his battalion of 175 volunteers, Siganok's patience in the war began to waver and he became increasingly interested in the American stance. Attesting his position as a peacekeeper, Siganok the Elder attended the 1778 Intertribal Conference at Cahokia, 
where he and Clark were granted the opportunity to understand each other's positions. Informing Clark that he was not concerned with elaborate ceremonies and was well acquainted, well acquainted with, Bra with Britain's policies, he welcomed the opportunity to, to, hear, to hear the American point of view. Upon meeting with the Milwaukee leader for several hours, Clark describes the head man as a polite gentleman who spoke as much in a European manner as possible. In a show of mutual respect, when the council was over, Clark gifted the elder two horses and numerous gifts, and the old chief accepted. Initially based in intrigue, their meeting became a catalyst to the only known belligerence committed by Saginaw the Elder during the revolution. Agreed by, angered by the amount of influence British traders had over his St. Joseph kinsmen and heeding their pleas for help, Saginaw knew that his meeting with Clark two years before was enough to keep the U.S. at bay and petitioned his old ally, Spanish Louisiana, to aid in the attack to overthrow the English occupation of the river valley and subdue growing threats of an attack on St. Louis. His pleas did not fall on deaf ears. On February 12, 1781, the Spanish captain, Eugene Poiré, and 65 soldiers, along with Saginac, Windstriker, and a force of 73 fire warriors, attacked Fort St. Joseph. Capturing the post in a matter of minutes, the fort was claimed in the name of Spain, and the trade goods were then dispensed among local Potawatomi. Victorious, the Spanish and Anishinaabeg force returned to St. Louis, leaving Fort St. Joseph to the vice of the locals. With his thirst for battle quenched and his position as Ogama cemented, Siganak the Elder put his weapons away for good and returned to his position of diplomacy. In an effort to prove his position as a warrior and step out from a peaceful shadow of his father, Siganak the Younger, nearly 18 years of age, decides to denounce the Elder's policies and create his own legacy. Blackbird and his close friend, Mad Sturgeon, a young prominent warrior from the Gigo Dotum, enlisted to fight in the famed Osage War of 1793. Intent on protecting the bustling Creole commerce of the Louisiana Territory from the Osage incursions, Spanish officials tapped into the traditional Osage Potawatomi blood feud, pleading to the fire keepers to take up the war club against their old enemies. Thirsty for blood and traditional coups in the relative peacetime after the Battle of Fallen Timbers, and the resulting of Treaty of Greenville, young Potawatomi anxiously crossed over the Mississippi to engage in a warrior's rite of passage. Not known for restraint, the young Saginaw's exploits during the bloody campaigns caught the attention of Mad Surgeon's brother-in-law, famed warrior in Wabano, Maine Pock. A large and muscular Potawatomi from the Lake Peoria region of central Illinois, Maine Pock was well known for his strong medicine and ability to converse with spirits. Wabanos were spiritualists who could control fire and regularly demonstrated their powers by handling hot coals or submerging their arms in vats of boiling water and syrup. These religious elite were also shapeshifters, able to tr transform into animals, prowling and attacking their enemies at night. Such men, including Maine Pock, were employed either for protection or more malevolent reasons. Further furthering his mystique, the burly warrior was born without fingers on his left hand. A deformity he touted as a symbol of power from the Creator. It was meant to distinguish him from commoners when Kishamido looked upon the earth. Translated generally as left or withered hand, referencing his divine abnormality, Main Pop was considered to be one of the most powerful spiritualists at his time, only rivaled by the Shawnee prophet Tinchka In 1807, the prophet's new faith reached Main Pop and other Illinois Potawatomi. With a reputation preceding him, the famed, the famed Shawnee warrior Tecumseh and his brother were intent on meeting the esteemed Wabada. That fall, Maine Pock and his lieutenants, Mad Sturgeon and Saginaw the Younger, were invited to confer with Tecumseh and the Prophet at their Ohio village. Resulting from the two-month visit was a pact between the Shawnees and the Potawatomi Triumphant, an invitation for Tecumseh to move his village to Indiana. The move would centralize the war leader's efforts and allow for protection under Maine Pock's watch. When the agreement made, Maine Pock, Tecumseh's new field general, left Ohio. However, he and his warriors were intercepted by William Wells, the victim of Blackbird at Fort Dearborn, as they passed through Fort Wayne on their ways to their winter villages. In a rare opportunity, the American captain wooed the Potawatomi warriors with extravagant gifts, 
in the hopes of refuting the words of the Shawnee and gaining a, pow gaining a powerful Potawatomi alliance. Still unsure of Maine Pox, Matt Sturgeon's, and Siganok's convictions, William Wells invited the party along with their wives to visit the president in Washington. The trip was an attempt to intimidate the influential warriors with the grand architecture and large populations of the eastern states. In December 1808, the three met personally with Thomas Jefferson as he urged them to become agriculturalists and ensured them of the United States' interest in their well-being. Despite the intentions of the trip, it truly served only as a reconnaissance into the heart of the enemy. Eclipsed by both his predecessors and contemporaries, Siganok's role as a key player in the War of 1812 cannot be contested. Despite his absence from the majority of records recounting this pivotal time, it's those few that do exist describing his defense of Prophetstown, leadership at the Battle of Fort Dearborn, and stand at Frenchtown that bring the man to life. At Prophetstown, he was among the Illinois warriors personally called to arms by the Shawnee prophet. In an attempt to strike at the heart of the Native movement, William Henry Harrison, governor of the Northwest Territory, and nearly 1,000 troops made up of infantry, cavalry, and militia descended upon Tecumseh's capital. This audacious move was spurred by reports of the Shawnee's absence enlisting forces from the southeast. Tenshkawatewa watched nervously as Harrison's forces drew closer. Realizing that they were outnumbered, the Potawatomi, also led by Wabunzi, Winnemac, and Shebne, and the hundreds of Shawnee, Kickapoo, Ho-Chunk, Odawa, and Wyandotte, encamped within the Palisades, initiated a, surprise, initiated a surprise attack on their enemies. While sneaking into the American camp just before dawn, they were spotted by a guard and fired upon. The native company was quickly overtaken in a relatively short battle. Exuding dominance in what he considered a complete and decisive victory, Harrison remained on the battlefield and in the vicinity of Prophetstown for two days, as the native stronghold and subsequent supplies were destroyed by fire. The defeat of Prophetstown only enraged Saganak and the other Potawatomi, losing nearly 200 kinsmen. The Meshkodan returned to the plains of Illinois to collect American scalps and goods owed to them for their dead. Two years later, with American forces controlling northern Ohio and making preparations to move on the British stronghold at Detroit, thousands of Tecumseh's followers migrated north to repel the American front. On January 18, 1813, U.S. General James Winchester arrived at the Maumee River in preparation for an attack on Detroit. Receiving reports that a small mixed force of native and British troops were at nearby Frenchtown, Winchester directly disobeys the orders of his commander, William Henry Harrison, and orders an attack. One quickly came by the Americans, who continued on to the nearby River Raisin. When news of the attack reaches British commander Henry Proctor, nearly 1,500 troops, including Saganak, are ordered to engage Winchester. In a short but feverish battle, Saganak and the British gain control over the river. Upon Winchester's surrender, he attempts to negotiate for the security of his fallen and imprisoned troops, a desperate and failed hope. Reminiscent of his deeds at Fort Dearborn in the fall at Prophetstown, Saganak and his inebriated party of three fires and Lenape warriors begin randomly killing the wounded Americans left on the battlefield, while others are taken captive and ransomed from nearby villages. In later years, Saganak, a complex historical figure, exhibits the dual nature of his character by finally adopting the diplomatic strengths of his father. Working with his enemies to find a resolution, his name can be found amongst the treaties and compacts being thin between the United States and the Potawatomi Nation. Accepting the role of benefactor and landowner, Siganok assumes various titles in a theorized attempt to distance himself from his mainland past, an act not uncommon of Potawatomi at the time. While the subtle tactics of Saganak the Elder can be appreciated, its Blackbird's legacy as a fierce warrior cannot be overshadowed, a fact he eloquently sums up in an 1830 debriefing conducted by the British Indian Department. The contentious nature of the speech is in response to the British's reproach of Saganak's brutal tactics during the War of 1812. Despite awarding him a Medal of Honor for the controversial assault on Fort Dearborn less than a year before, what the Crown's officials continually fail to understand 
is that Saginaw and his intertribal alliance were not merely grunts to the British or any other foreign cause, but belligerents of another nature who fought not only to repulse, but collect retribution for the nearly 200 years of unabated Anglo encroachment on their homeland. It's an eye for an eye. It was a fight begun by their fathers and deserving an end at their hands. These are the words of Saginaw. Quote, we have listened to your words, which words come from our father. We will now say a few words to you. At the foot of the rapids last spring, we fought the big knives, and we lost some of our people there. When we retired, the big knives got some of our dead. They were not satisfied with having killed them, but cut them into small pieces. This made us very angry. My words to my people were, as long as the powder burnt, to kill and scout. But those behind us came up and did mischief. Last year, Chicago and St. Joseph, the big knives destroyed all our corn. This was fair. But brother, they did not allow the dead to rest. They dug up their graves and the bones of our ancestors were thrown away and we could never find them to return them to the ground. I've listened with a good deal of attention to the wish of our father. If the big knives, after they kill our people of color, leave them without hacking them to pieces, we will follow their example. They have themselves to blame. The way they treat our killed and the remains of those that are in their graves in the West makes our people mad when they meet the big knives. Whenever they get any of our people into their hands, they cut them like meat into small pieces. We thought white people were Christians. They ought to show us a better example. We do not disturb their dead. What I say is known to all people present. I do not tell a lie. Thank you.